So today we're going to talk about a different angle on a typical HR topic. It's about avoiding the important things that could really go wrong. What we're talking about today is risk management that's coming up right now. Hi there, I'm Andrea Adams, and this is the HR Hub. Here, you're going to learn about anything related to HR. I encourage you to subscribe to the show or podcast to keep learning from my guests. Today, my guest is Bob Stenhouse. Bob is a really interesting guy. He's a retired undercover police officer who has taken his investigative skill and his expertise into the world of the workplace. He has a pretty unique personal story, which... We might not have time to get into today, but I will in another episode. Hi, Bob. How are you? I'm doing well, Andrea. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Looking forward to this. So I don't usually, we don't usually talk about like the background and the the, the employment circumstances of my guests. However, in your case, it's relevant. You market your company as a risk management firm. Why do you, what kind of risk do you advise on? Yeah, well, you know, I talked to a little bit about my background, Andrea, as you identified that I am a former police officer. And um, so when we talk about the topic of risk management, um, oftentimes we we risk manage without knowing that we risk manage. Um, we naturally risk manage. Um, but I have, as you know, a bit of a wild and crazy story, former undercover hitman, um, been in jail, um, investigated uh, organized crime figures, biker gangs uh, throughout my whole career. And um, what was really interesting is that after I left policing, um, I went into the largest uh, employer in Alberta, uh, largest health authority in Canada, Alberta Health Services. And my role was the executive director for protective services. One of the uh, roles coming under me was investigations, as well as basically risk management related to security issues. What I discovered was we were spending millions and millions of dollars protecting our assets um, from threats outside, external threats. So in other words, this is what you see when you go into the hospital. You've got your card swipe access, of yeah. course, can't get anywhere. You've got your cameras, you've got all kinds of things that we put into place to protect our assets from external threats. What I discovered in 10 years running investigations or overseeing major investigations and complex investigations is oftentimes our major threats were from within. Mm-hmm. And that goes to the behavior of employees, management, directors, all the way up to the senior level that the uh, HR risks or the risks to the organization, the big risks that could hit the news that we were putting out fires on over the over the years and investigating and making sure the right thing was done came from within. Mm-hmm. And so the idea of, I think it's a bit of a paradigm shift, particularly for some HR practitioners to say, have we actually put a risk lens on how our managers and our business partners are managing um, human resource risks, right? And like people's behavior internally that could cause a risk um, uh, for either legal risk or reputational risk or, or a financial risk. You talk about, you know, the different lenses of risk, you know, in an HR sense. Can you elaborate on, like, like how would we do that as HR? How would we actually go about looking at everything from a risk lens? Yeah. I think first and foremost is awareness, right? That if we look at, I'll give you an example, Andrea, that um, on my, uh, my workplace investigation courses, I get to... Um, interact with um, many HR professionals across the country, and I do little, in, you know, little polls. And I think you've had one of my courses, and so I do polls, and I've asked the HR professional this question: What percentage of employees t- are taking up eighty percent of your time trying to help manage unreasonable conflict, churn, uh, complaints? behavioral issues, what percentage of employees are taking up 80% of the HR practitioner's time? The average consistently comes out to 5 to 10%. Mm-hmm. Right across Canada, right across yeah. industry. And I'm talking industry from um, from blue-collar, uh, rough-around-the-edges guys doing pipeline construction, yeah. Yeah. all the way up to universities, over to the clinical side, physicians, surgeons, nurses, um, right across the spectrum of industries, 
the consistent number is that five to ten percent. Mm-hmm. So how do we how do we explain that the consistency of that you know that that opinion of every HR practitioner that I deal with, and and I believe that it comes down to that awareness that there can be behavior that we can anticipate is going to, um, if we don't manage this well, is going to cause significant risk. I want to ask it now. I have to ask it now. What are some of the risks? Yeah, as an example, um, the risk that I'm I'm t- uh, advising our clients on right now, um, the current cultural risk is going to be related to LGBTQT rights. Oh. Okay, because people hold very, very strong convictions one way or the other on the rights of those um, that identify as part of the LGBTQT2S community. And those very, very strong opinions are going to come into the workplace. And some people don't have filters on how they express their strong opinions, uh, either um, against the rights of LGBTQT2S uh, us. Um, or for, and so therefore these conflicts start to churn. The law and the legislation is clearly, is very clear on human rights in the workplace, um, health and safety legislation in the workplace. The law is very clear, but people um, think it's okay to express their beliefs in a way that could be very, very harmful. Mm -hmm. So if someone has a strong view of, as an example, um, we have one case where someone had a very strong view of um, whether or not women should be working in male dominant, um, historically male dominant industries, so construction mm-hmm. or carpentry, mm-hmm. and those views are expressed in a very um, vitriolic way or a very aggressive way. They're just signaling what they believe about women working in a male dominant environment. They're signaling their belief. Those beliefs will often come out in behavior. Behavior could look like discrimination, bullying, harassment, setting someone up to fail, um, sabotage of someone's work because my belief is so strong with Mm -hmm. respect to these issues. So before we get around, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question about that, about, okay, so uh, you see these risks coming down the pipeline. What did you do about it? Before that, can you walk us through uh, the principles, basic principles of risk management? Absolutely. So, so uh, risk management itself is based on. Uh, you know, if I had a slide, I have my slide up. Across industries, people that are involved in risk management understand that on the one axis, you have the consequence or the impact of an issue. Yeah. On the other axis, you have the likelihood of that occurring. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me give you an example. The consequence of a mismanaged sexual harassment case for any industry, if it's mismanaged, it could result in a lawsuit. It could result in uh, media exposure. It could result in um, reputational damage because it was mismanaged. That's the consequence of not managing a sexual harassment case well. Yeah. We see it across the news. All we have to Google is sexual harassment workplace, and you're going to see dozens and dozens of headlines right now that are occurring uh, in real time. How do we reduce the likelihood of that happening? Right. So to be very, just very, um, I guess, basic, we reduce the likelihood of it happening by managing the issue well. Mm -hmm. If we mismanage, it causes risk. If we manage it well, it's going to reduce the risk. How do we manage it well? We investigate. We investigate with impartiality. We make sure that someone that's doing the investigation has the right skill set, the right tools, the right training, um, the right motivation. There's no apprehension of bias. So you investigate. You find out what happened. If you find out that someone has engaged in sexual harassment or sexual assault in the workplace, you discipline. You 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 um, bring about the appropriate consequence, mm-hmm. appropriate level of accountability. That's how you manage that risk. And we have seen over and over, some of these cases have hit the news and they've hit national news. We've seen over and over and over that the mismanagement of the issues is what's causing the risk. So the HR professional who's working with their business partner, if they're um, aware of that and if they have the appropriate level of influence, that it's that influence, it's that informing the senior leaders, if you proceed this way, you're placing yourself at risk. 
And sometimes it has to be that blunt. I have hap- apprehension when I do that, that they're going to say, they're going to be calculating the risk matrix there in their mind, and they're going to go, yes, the risk is, but the probability is very, it's it's unlikely. This is not hitting the news I don't care. And I've had, I've had clients say that to me as well. And then six months later, it's on the front page. Mm. And I had, I had predicted it. I had let them know is that you need to know if you pay attention to what's going on culturally, Ah. coming out of of the Me Too movement, coming out of the Black Lives Matter movement, coming out out of the LGBTQT rights movements that are happening right now. Yeah. Is that people are becoming empowered to tell their story, yes. expose mismanagement. Um, it's happening on LinkedIn. It's happening on social media. If it gets oh. the attention of mainstream media, it will happen in mainstream media. And so anticipating those risks, seeing around the corner and doing the right thing here and now is going to mitigate those risks. Right. Now, here's where I find it's a little bit challenging is oftentimes our leaders are getting mixed messages. They may get a, a message from me um, as the CEO of a risk management firm and say, I can, you can anticipate these risks. And then they get messages from perhaps a lawyer, perhaps a lawyer that doesn't understand labor and employment law. Mm-hmm. And they give them bad advice. Mm-hmm. And so now oftentimes what happens is leaders will defer to the lawyers because they assume yeah. that the lawyers really understand this stuff. And it's been my experience that unless they're actually really um, integrated into the what's going on right now with uh, employment labor law, they may not understand the potential risks of mismanagement. Right. So, uh, do you see any? Do you see any risks coming down the pipeline, uh, like you know, cultural changes that we need to start thinking about? Oh, absolutely. And I think that if you look at the evolution of legislation, um, law and legislation across certainly the Western world has Mm -hmm. consistently evolved to be progressive in terms of human rights. So we can anticipate that the law will evolve to ensure that people's rights are respected in the workplace. And that means rights related to any of the um, protected grounds under the Human Rights Act, including um, sexual orientation, gender identity. So you've talked a little bit about what can go wrong if you if we do this wrong. Um, do you have any story you can tell about what has some of the consequences you've seen? Yeah, I can't really disclose um, one of our cases, but the, your detectives out there, your sleuths out there could probably find it very quickly. And you just need to Google class action lawsuits, Alberta, um, and you'll probably find one of the serious cases that that we both investigated and uh, did our best to help the organization risk manage. And so we're talking upwards of millions of dollars from a class action lawsuit. We're talking over a year to a year and a half of ne- negative media exposure. Um, reputational damage, and frankly, one of the things we can't lose uh, sight of is damaged lives. We're talking about people. We're talking about people and their livelihoods. We're talking about their mental health. We're talking about um, uh, PTSD. We're talking about um, psychological safety. People's lives and livelihoods have been significantly damaged in some cases that have been mismanaged. Mm -hmm. So... um, you know, read, read, um, um, have your, your listeners Google um, first responder sexual harassment or police, fire, Department of National Defense, uh, EMS, historically male dominant um, uh, paramilitary structures are at significant risk of these issues. Why is that? Well, you have a, a paramilitary structure infers a more of a dictatorial type of leadership, right? right? Um, That, you know, from a military perspective, right? Rank is basically you do as you're told, you do as you're directed. Now that's shifting. There are progressive leaders in those paramilitary structures. And those progressive leaders sometimes come up against uh, leaders that don't like a progressive attitude towards how we lead. So if I take my power from my rank and I don't want my power to be questioned, I am going to bark orders, and as soon as it's questioned, I'm probably going to bully someone into deferring to my barked orders. 
if I'm a collaborative leader, if I'm a leader that wants to hear from other people, that wants to make decisions based on the viewpoint of a diverse team, I might be clashing against this historical, you know, male dominant, patriarchal, paramilitary type of structure. That gets into like even the way your organization set up creates HR risk. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and then so now we're talking about this is where I kind of go into a little bit more of a philosophical discussion about power. So any any um, abuse, whether it be harassment, bullying, sexual harassment, sexual assault, any form of abuse, psychological, physical, sexual, is about power. Okay. And so if you have a structure that protects power, and you have people that use their power irresponsibly, chances are you're at risk of having these situations show up in the workplace, okay. right? So how people manage their power, how people utilize their power can be a risk factor. So how does HR, what can HR do? I mean, I have seen it. Oh my God. You know, in every single harassment, bullying case, there's some power dynamic at play. You know, and he's a, even as someone moves up the hierarchy, they're promoted, they have more power. What can we do uh, to help them think about that power. And I mean, it's ridiculous. It's like right out of uh, Marvel comics. Yeah. Uh, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> How can we in HR help the organization think about those things? Well, a couple of things. I mean, it really depends on HR's role, right? I mean, I've seen organizations where HR has a very significant role. In fact, um, I would recommend that anyone at the senior level of HR, they should be reporting directly to the CEO. There should not yeah. be there should not be a level between the CEO and HR. Um, that's one thing because that increases influence, right? Okay. Secondly, the HR professional is, um, they're an influencer. Yes. And with that, there needs to be courage to speak the truth to power. In most kinds of dysfunctional companies, isn't that how you get fired? Oh, absolutely. That's going to be the risk. Um, I've been I've been terminated from my employment three times <laughs> for speaking truth to power. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and in hindsight, I look back and I wouldn't change anything because I did speak truth. Now, some folks in power that are maybe um, they they have fragile egos, they're not willing to hear the truth, might not like that. Yeah. Um, but I've you know I've finally become fairly comfortable with my own skin in my early sixties of saying this is what I believe in is that I believe that's why I've named my company Veritas, which means truth. Right. Um, that's why one of our mottos is to seek truth and speak truth. Is that. As a consultant, I have the um, I have the ability as a consultant to speak truth to power, even though they might not like it. And mm -hmm. that's what we make sure that we do. Um, we don't compromise on giving people what they want to hear. We will give our clients what they need to hear. So if you've got an HR pro professional who's in that position, they don't they don't have a lot of organizational power. Do you have any tips on how? They can handle that. One of the things that I recommend to the HR practitioner is that we, when we present our um, our influence or our viewpoint, yeah, our our firm and our team, and even in my courses, I don't moralize. I'm not I'm not moralizing someone's decisions. I'm putting it through a risk lens. Oh, and so I'm not saying that hey, you leaders are immoral. You're cowards. You're this. You're this. That that's not going to influence anybody. I am putting decision making through a risk lens. And so I will say very clearly if you proceed down this way of dealing with this, you're increasing your exposure and risk. And then inevitably it becomes the decision maker's uh, decision to take that risk. You know, there's this thing called, um, you know, plausible deniability. Some senior leaders don't want to hear, right, what the risks are. And so that plausible deniability, well, I didn't know this was going on versus, oh, you did because we actually sent you an email to let you know that this is a risk right now and this is serious. And so putting it within the lens of risk, I believe that the mature, thoughtful, wise leader is going to appreciate it. I also believe that the immature, unwise, maybe ego-driven uh, leader might not appreciate it. And of course, then we have the natural consequence coming out of that. That was amazing. Uh, I love that angle on, uh, y you know, approaching it from a risk. And I've actually used that angle myself, probably um, not so intentionally, right? but I have shared it that way and it is more well received. 
Yes. Okay. So uh, what are some of the concrete actions, and perhaps you've said this already, but the concrete actions HR can take to mitigate these people risks? I would say by bringing in education on the concept of human resource risk management, right? So there are risk management firms or there's something, a concept called enterprise risk management. And oftentimes, if you look at training and risk management, it's going to be related to financial. It's going to be related to yes. It's going to be related right. to all those things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're here, we're talking about a very specific risk, and that's HR risk management. And so uh, there's very few firms in Canada that would um, call themselves an HR risk management firm. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say that we are the leading firm in HR risk management, partly coming out of my own experience of what I saw and how I, I saw the the development of the need for this type of education. So certainly education on HR risk management, yep. uh, awareness and putting in systems, uh, potentially putting in a process or procedure where the HR practitioner is empowered and encouraged to bring real language to the senior leaders and identify risk. It will take some time for some organizations that are not healthy, there's going to be some rumble there. Yeah. Yeah. A senior leader that is evolving into a position where they want to understand their risk so that they clearly can mitigate the risk um, is obviously a leader that you want to have. And so education, um, systems and process procedures where the HR practitioner, um, no matter the level, is empowered and enabled to speak the truth and bring the risk forward, I think is key. Again, educating senior leaders on HR risk management. You know, webinars, um, we do a lot of training and, and, and webinars and, and, and small little snippets of training for an hour on yeah. HR risk management 101. The right. more we understand it, the more we can mitigate it. I'm just, I'm, I'm shocked sometimes at the, when I read the headlines that, um, I know that behind the headlines, there are a lot of boardroom discussions. What, what should we do here? <laughs> and there's lots of opinion on what we should do here. And sometimes it's like, uh oh, I messed up. Um, I'm part of this problem that could be exposed. And so, therefore, I want to um, minimize the potential risk. Oh, yes. Then it hits the fan. And the next thing you know, it, it is in the, uh, in the uh, headlines. So, awareness, commitment, and the HR practitioner to actually, um, you know, kind of educate themselves on the issue. So, they, do feel empowered and enabled to speak the truth and do the right thing. Such a refreshing way of looking at some of these things. Okay, um, we're running out of time. Where can someone learn more? Contact us at Veritas Solutions. Uh, <laughs> yes. Visit our website. Um, yeah. Look at some of the courses that we're uh, we're that we provide. Um, workshops, um, those types of things. And we're more than willing to you know to come into your organization and help educate on these particular issues. We are a risk management firm. We're not just investigations. Now, interestingly, Andrew, we learn from every one of our investigations. So we have the capability, uh, we're doing over 150 a year. We have the capability of learning from each and every one of us and each and every one of those and bringing those learnings to our clients in our education stream. Yeah. So we're able to say we had a case where this occurred. So we can pretty well almost predict the trajectory of the story. And we want to help you mitigate that risk through our educational stream. Mm -hmm. And so we have an educational stream. We have our proactive educational stream. We have our, our, um, we have our investigation stream. We have our consulting stream where we're brought in as consultants. And now here's the, here's the key thing for me is that we are not a PR firm. There are PR firms out there. There are communications firms out yes, there. Yes. Um, we don't do that. And the reason being is that we don't sugarcoat and we won't. If, if you were to ask me, what is my recommendation for any senior leader or HR practitioner on how to mitigate the risks related to these issues of hitting the news, harassment, sexual harassment, discrimination, um, it really boils down to doing the right thing. Okay. Huh. And doing the right thing is investigating it properly, holding people properly accountable to their misconduct, making it right by the persons that were impacted by that misconduct. That means the person that was bullied, harassed, sexually harassed, making it right by them. Yeah. And then putting in systems, processes, and procedures to ensure it doesn't happen again. That's how you manage the risk. Well, thanks, Bob. That was amazing. I love that. The part I uh, resonated most for me was where you talked about uh, sharing the message and don't moralize. 
speak about risk. And I instinctively tried that and I know it works, but I'm going to do it a lot more now. I also did another basic episode about doing investigations. The link to that's right here. Thanks for watching out there. We'll see you next time.